This is Chapter 25, The Child with Cancer, Part 3, and we're talking about transfusion reactions. Um, so when you do give a transfusion, remember you've got to take the vitals beforehand, start it slowly, and do the vitals again at 15 minutes. And depending on your hospital policy, that's usually when then you can increase it to the rate um, you're going to give it. If you get the blood from blood bank, you've got to hang it within 30 minutes. If something happens where it's going to take longer, you send it back. And you've got to use it within four hours of when you begin that infusion. Um, and so these are all things to help minimize problems. Uh, but not all of our transfusion reactions happen immediately. That is the most common, which is why we start it slowly. So we can stop it quickly and have given them the least amount uh, possible, but it can happen later. Sometimes that blood may have an infection in it. Um, we do test blood for all sorts of things to try and prevent that, but remember early in an infection, sometimes things don't show up yet. And so it can still happen, although it's quite rare now because um, we really try. Or you can have a hemolytic reaction that's a little bit down the road. So the body starts destroying that blood um, after days, five to 10 days after the, the transfusion. Usually uh, the patient will develop a fever. They may very well complain of flank pain as those broken red blood cells plug up the kidneys. Um, but we need to make sure family knows to to bring the child in if they have any signs of uh, reaction, you know, oh, days to a week to 10 days after. So stem cell transplant. This is kind of our uh, cure for many of our cancers, but the problem is it's really a cure or a kill. Um, we are going to try and get the best matched uh, cells we can and relatives are usually your best bet um, but doesn't have to be what if they're taking just from a random donor they're going to get the best match that they possibly can and uh, if you're a donor giving stem cells they will put an IV in draw your blood out spin the stem cells out of the blood and then return the blood back to you they actually have you give yourself several shots um, in the week beforehand to stimulate stem cell production so you have more than normal. Uh, and then they take those stem cells and give those to the recipient. Umbilical uh, cord blood is very high in stem cells, so that can be used as well. Uh, those stem cells are then given as a, an IV infusion into the person with cancer. And the hope is that those uh, cells will then deposit into the bone marrow, begin multiplying, and become normal functioning bone marrow, uh, making normal cells instead of leukemic cells, instead of affected cells. The problem is we have to totally kill off that person's bone marrow, which means um, if the donor backs out for whatever reason at the last minute, the the recipient will pretty much die. I mean, we've destroyed all their bone marrow. They have no way um, to come back without receiving the, the transplanted uh, stem cells. And if they have a negative reaction to it, it will, it will kill them. Um, so most of the time they do fine, but if they don't, it will probably kill them. And that's why we kind of save it for the last uh, ditch effort. We don't do it if they're um, unless they're going to die anyway and you know that really concerns the family when you say chances are this will kill them or I mean this will cure them but if it doesn't it will kill them so we're gonna wait until they're like they will die from the um, cancer without a treatment and then we'll do the transplant um, because if they do have a reaction there really isn't anything we can do um, or if that bone marrow doesn't, the stem cells we give them don't 
um, engraft and start reproducing and making bone marrow uh, in the recipient. Um, there's really not much else we can do. You can try another transplant, but um, the likelihood of success is very low. So moving on to some other tumors, uh, central nervous system tumors. These are tumors in the brain or neuroblastomas, which are part of um, the central nervous system, but not in the brain, but they, they're on neural tissue. And so these are about 20% of childhood cancers. These are um, can be difficult to treat, and survival rates are really not very good for these type of cancers. So the signs and symptoms really depend on where it is. Um, if it's inside the brain, we're going to see uh, increased intracranial pressure, but depending on you know which is headache, nausea, vomiting. Um, but depending on where it is, you'll get more specific uh, symptoms. We're going to diagnose it by using imaging, MRI, CT. We may use an EEG looking at brain waves. That's usually for um, seizures. Um, they may do angiography where they put uh, dye in and watch the blood flow, right? Because tumors use lots of blood. So you can tell where that is. Uh, lumbar puncture to... Um, see if it's in the, the CSF fluid, um, but really the definitive diagnosis, we've got to have a biopsy, which means it's not going to be totally diagnosed until after surgery, and we have that tumor to look at what um, cancer type of cells are there. So treatment for brain tumors. Um, really depends on where it is and how difficult it is to get to, but surgery, if we can, to take it out. Some of these are easy. The margins around the tumor are very clear. Some of them are not, that they've got little, you know, tentacles that stick out into the, the brain tissue, um, and so it makes it very hard to get everything out. Radiotherapy using, um, you know, irradiating it, uh, and chemotherapy um, can all be used. Neuroblastoma is um, a tumor that's on the, in the, the nervous system, but it's not inside the brain. In fact, most often um, it's in the abdomen, retroperitoneal, so the back of the, the peritoneum. Um, these are a really bad tumor to have uh, because they metastasize early and they're considered a silent tumor. There are rarely signs until it is quite advanced and um, has metastasized. So diagnosing it, um, locate where it is and locate where metastases are. Um, Again, symptoms are going to depend on where it is. They do staging of this and, um, you know, do studies to figure out where it is and um, what it has invaded uh, can go into the kidney. So that's why that uh, IVP to evaluate if it's metastasized to the kidneys. Um, but in general, uh, the earlier they're diagnosed, the better the outcome, and that's just because um, it's less likely to be as widespread, but it is considered um, a silent uh, tumor, and so you rarely have symptoms. Um, so a radiation chemotherapy can uh, do bone marrow transplantation, uh, stem cell rescue, but basically this is just a bad tumor to have. So prognosis is not good, and the younger you're diagnosed, usually the better the prognosis, just because the less um, widespread uh, metastases are, the less advanced. Osteosarcomas, this is bone cancer, and most often it's in the long bones. It's often near the knee, either the top of the, the tibia or the, the uh, distal uh, part of um, the femur. And this happens in teenagers. So we're going to have to remove the affected bone. They used to do amputation. They really try not to anymore. They take out the affected bone 
and put in a rod, a prosthetic bone there, and then they give chemotherapy. So here's a picture, both an x-ray of the osteosarcoma here and just sort of a, a cartoony drawing of what it looks like. So um, that's got to be taken off, taken out that section of bone. And then, uh, as I said, then they'll do chemotherapy. Wilms tumor. This is a tumor on the kidney, and this tends to happen in, in um, toddler to preschool age kids, where that osteosarcoma tends to be teenagers. A Wilms tumor is an encapsulated tumor. So usually what you see is an abdominal mass, but it's painless. Um, we have to do surgery to take this out. They'll usually take out the kidney with it. Occasionally it's on both kidneys, but usually it's going to just be one. And then after that, they'll do chemotherapy and possibly radiation. Um, survival rate, rates are very good as long as the tumor has stayed encapsulated. Once that capsule is broken, you get seeds of tumor. Um, they get out, and then you have metastases everywhere. And then the, the um, survival rates are not good. But as long as it's still encapsulated, and it stays encapsulated um, fairly long. So it that's helpful, too. So the most important thing, if a child's come in and is going to go to surgery to remove a Wilms tumor, you do not want to palpate the abdomen. The last thing you want to do is to break that capsule that surrounds the tumor. And when they're taking it out surgically, they're very careful to try and not spill any tumor seeds from, you know, to letting them get out of that capsule. So here's just kind of a picture. Here's the kidney with the tumor on it, right? You can live with one kidney. It's got one normal one. Um, the kids are in trouble as if they have two, then they'll have to try and save one of the part of the kidney. But if they can, they're going to just take everything out, right? So here it is, totally encapsulated, easy to get it out without it um, causing any problem. By the time we get to stage four, we've got it outside of um, the capsule and, and metastases have started. Rhabdomyosarcoma. This rhabdomyo is skeletal um, muscle. So this is a tumor uh, that begins in just tissue, muscle tissue. It can be anywhere. Most often, though, it's going to be in the head and the neck. So we're going to surgically take this tumor out and then give chemo. Um, survival rates are pretty good. 60 to 80 percent if it hasn't metastasized and the earlier it's diagnosed and, and treated, then we get, you know, uh, closer to 80 percent. Um, if it has metastasized or if it comes back after it's been treated, then the prognosis is not good at all. Um, okay, and then retinoblastoma, the retina of the eye, right? So this is a tumor on the retina, and this is usually found in um, infants or very young children, most often on one eye, uh, but it can be both. Most of them um, just happen, but there can be a hereditary uh, cause here. Um, but again, most are one eye and non-hereditary. What you see is a whitish, ref a whitish glow to the eye. They call it cat's eye reflex because you don't see that normal red reflex because you don't have the blood vessels in the retina because you have a tumor there instead. So this is usually going to be diagnosed by ophthalmic evaluation. It metastasizes very late, so metastases are rare. They usually can save the eye, um, so they'll try and irradiate the tumor, um, or if not the tumor itself, the blood supply to the tumor and then take it out. So they do the best they can to save the eye. Um, it can't always happen, but they try to. And here's what this, this kid's pupils have been dilated, I believe, but you can see how you get that white reflex. A lot of times parents will take a picture and they'll say, we got a red reflex, you know, the red eye on pictures in one eye and not in the other. It was white in the other. And that's when you want to um, get this checked.